know. Hello, everybody. Morning. Hello. Hello. To say a massive thank you to Hannah for coming down from Newcastle, all the way from Newcastle to talk to us. Uh, Hannah did this talk at Agile Northeast Lightning Talks, and it won an amazing prize, which is really, really good. Um, and I think I've, I've got massive apologies to make to Hannah in that I spelt her name wrong on the program. Uh, so, Anna <laughs> Pretzrell, and I'd like you to give her a massive round of applause. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Who here is a sleepy tester? I'm definitely, I'm not a morning person, so this is going to be quite difficult. Do apologise if I sort of nod off halfway through. Um, so, yes, I'm Hannah, here to talk to you about sort of how sleep affects our ability to stay at the forefront of tech. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I work at Scott Logic up in Newcastle. Um, I love dogs, which is why I'm wearing a skirt with dogs on it. Um, I'm also co-organiser of Ministry of Testing Newcastle meetup as well. Um, so yeah, if you ever want to come along, just chat to me. And I also have way too many hobbies. So I like to hang upside down on things. I like to climb things. I like to draw things, play things, bake things, play different things, cross-stitch things, <laughs> play different sorts of things. <laughs> and I like to read things. So as you can imagine, I've got like a lot of stuff going on. I'm always thinking about things and I have a horrific sort of inability to sleep. So this talk is very much a, you know, do as I say, not as I do. I actually tracked my sleep for the past sort of month. I think it was in May. And I averaged about 6.3 hours of sleep a night, which isn't great because the recommended amount is seven to nine hours of sleep a night. So falling quite short there. So as I said, I like to read books and I read this book, um, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. It's a very interesting book and I would definitely recommend it. So I started off, um, I made like a little three minute lightning talk internally at work, presented that. And then I expanded it to an eight minute lightning talk, as um, Stephen said, which came third place at Agile Northeast uh, competition. I got myself a little robot, which is really cute. It lives, <laughs> it's basically like my little pet now. Um, and now it is some amount of minutes talk because every time I run through it, it seems to change. It's like 15 minutes and then it's 30 minutes. I'm like, I just have no idea what's going on. And a quick disclaimer as well. I'm not a doctor. Please see a doctor if you are worried about anything. So a few questions before we get started. Hands up if you get a full eight hours of sleep a night. Wow, this is, oh, oh I was good. just about to say this is the first honest audience I've had. <laughs> Hands up if you would sleep through if you didn't have an alarm clock. Yeah. Um, hands up if you could easily fall back asleep mid-morning after waking up. Yeah, cool. And hands up if you need a caffeinated beverage or three to function <laughs> optimally before lunchtime. Yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised considering the uproar if the coffee machine, God forbid, ever breaks at work. <coughs> and speaking of caffeine, so NASA did a study on sort of the effects of different drugs on spiders and their, their web-making abilities. And as you can see here, caffeine did pretty, pretty badly. <laughs> so I know that we're not spiders, but some of us are web developers, so it's just something to keep in mind. <laughs> it's a terrible joke. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, back to the questions. Um, if you put your hands up to any of the last three questions, it is quite likely that you are sleep deprived and you could be doing yourselves a disservice. So we all know that you, know, you need to get good exercise, you need to get a good diet to really sort of have like the best quality of life. But we work in very sort of cognitive based jobs and are we actually doing enough to look after our brains? So a little bit about sleep, um, obviously it comes in cycles, you get about five cycles a night, they last about 
90 minutes each. I'm only interested for the purpose of this talk in two stages of sleep. The first one is REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, also known as dream sleep. We tend to get that sort of in the later hours of, of the night. I'm also interested in non-REM, which is also known as deep sleep. You tend to get that sort of earlier on in the night. And you can see here, um, this is just a little screenshot from my, from my Fitbit, where I have got the deep sleep sort of earlier in the sleep night and the dream sleep a little bit later on. And why this is sort of important will become apparent as I, as I go through the talk. So, how does sleep affect our memory? So during the day, we tend to store all of our short-term memories in the hippocampus. You can think about it as, a, as a, like a USB drive. Um, there's, there's not a big amount of storage, and obviously as you fill it up, you might have to take things off to sort of fit more things on. During deep sleep, this is when we empty the short-term memories from our hippocampus into the cortex. So it's kind of like resetting that little USB drive so that you can use it fresh the next day and store as much memory as possible. So deep sleep is what's responsible for learning facts. So if you're trying to learn things, if you're trying to remember things, it's really important that you get deep sleep. And it also decides what needs forgetting, because you don't actually have to remember absolutely everything. Sometimes it's not crucial to remember what you ate last Tuesday. So hands up if you've been told to just sleep on it. Yeah. And there is a good reason why. So during dream sleep, it's sort of like a nighttime therapy session. It's the first, oh, it's the only time in 24 hours that the, the hormone, um, the stress-related hormone, norepinephrine, is completely shut off from the brain. So what this means is that we're processing memories in a very, very safe environment. So if you've had any sort of any trauma, this is when you know, we'll be able to process the memories and remove some of the emotions that were related to it so that when you think back on that memory, you don't feel the exact same emotions again. It's a lot more muted. So Matthew Walker details in his book a little study that they did. They put um, sort of like brain scan equipment on two groups of people. They showed them some emotionally charged images. They had one group either sleep within 12 hours and they had one group stay awake within 12 hours. They then showed them the same emotionally charged images again. And what they found was that people who slept during that 12 hours had a much lower emotional response to those images. And I think this is very important when we're working sort of when we're working with people, especially when things can get quite stressful, you're talking to people, and sometimes you know you can end up in arguments and things, and being able to sleep and then come back to it the next day means that you can sort of you can have conversations with a much clearer head. And I think that is crucial in our line of work especially because we have to do a lot of communication. And they also found that um, chronic sleep restriction is associated with greater financial risk taking. And the scary part of this is that the participants of the study didn't even realize that they were making riskier decisions. And I, again, I think this is really crucial for testing because we're always having to analyze risk. And if we don't even know that we're sort of, we're making riskier decisions during our day, like that's, that's a terrifying thought. So if we're getting enough sleep, we'll be making less risky decisions, we'll be able to sort of think better, make better decisions, and that's just, again, better for our, for our jobs. But good news is that the same was not shown for acute sleep deprivation. So this means that if you just get one night of bad sleep, it's not going to affect your sort of, your risk assessment abilities. This is another interesting study that was done. I think it was at the University of San Diego. Um, they basically had a, a group of people, they showed them, or they gave them a complex task. They then had them either rest or sleep, so either getting the deep sleep or um, the dream sleep. 
And then they gave them the same complex task and measured the improvement. And as you can see here, the improvement was pretty much the same across the board for doing the same complex task again. Deep sleep did do a little bit better, and that's because it's about fact learning, and doing the same complex task is essentially learning facts. Now, the interesting one <coughs> is they gave people a primer for a complex task, then after rest or sleep, gave them the actual complex tasks that they'd been primed for, measured the improvement, and you can see here that dream sleep improved massively. And this is because REM sleep is when we do all our problem solving, is when we make connections between things. And again, that's so important for our line of work because we're always having to solve problems, we're always having to figure things out, always having to make, th think of new ways to approach problems. And if we go back to that diagram that I showed you earlier, you can see that if you miss out on the earlier sort of stages of sleep, you're missing out on really important fact-based learning. And if you miss out on sort of, the, sort of later in the night, you're missing out on really, really important problem-solving abilities. <sighs> and sleep doesn't just affect our brains and the way that we think. It also affects our bodies as well. So I know earlier I said that exercise is sort of really important for keeping like healthy and it's also really good for like your mental health and things. So if you don't get enough sleep, it can actually disrupt your ability to sort of repair your muscles because it's deep sleep is when you get the growth hormone, it's when things repair. And a chronic lack of sleep is associated with, um, yeah, with more injuries. So you're more likely to injure yourself which means that you might put yourself out of action for a while, unable to do exercise, and unable to do hobbies that you really enjoy, which obviously, you know, isn't great for your just <coughs> general well-being. And you're not going to be able to do your best work if you're not able to do the things that you love. They also found that just two consecutive nights of four hours of sleep uh, decreased leptin levels, and leptin is responsible for making you feel full, and also increased ghrelin levels, which is what makes you uh, feel hunger. So you're more likely to eat more when you're feeling tired because of these hormone changes. And as you know, we said earlier, it's more, you're, more sort of, you're more likely to take risks. You're more likely to reach for a chocolate bar instead of a healthy apple. And it's also really important for muscle memory. During, um, during dream sleep, is when you make all the sort of connections between everything that you're learning. So um, if you want to learn how to play piano, you'll find that you'll really struggle on something one day, and then the next day you'll, you'll get it straight away. And that's because all the connections are being made during your dream sleep. And sleep is also really good for your immune system. You're a lot less likely to be ill. And it's also really, really important for the future. So there has been a correlation between um, sleep and Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is caused by a buildup of amyloid plaque. Um, and sleep is responsible for removing the beta amyloid protein. So when you get too much of this protein, you get a plaque form. And they found that just one night of sleep deprivation saw elevated beta amyloid protein levels in, not in, like in mice and also in humans, which is really, it's really scary. We really need to look after our brains. And interestingly, they also found that sleep and mental disorders are kind of a two-way street. There was, um, it was either that, that mental sort of issues could cause a lack of sleep, but they also found that a lack of sleep can actually cause a lot of mental issues. So that's something to sort of look into. If you're, you know, if you're really struggling to sleep, then obviously I would go see a doctor as well, but it could be, it could be causing a lot of issues. So basically, sleep affects everything that we do. It affects our ability to learn. It, it affects our ability to create memories. And this is not just for, for work, but also memories with your family and your relationships helps you solve problems, helps with your physical health, and it helps with your hobbies. And it also helps with the future. 
And we also get, on average, one hour sleep less a night than we did 50 years ago, despite the fact that 50 years ago we were in a lot more labor-intensive jobs. And now we're using our brains, or using our sort of cognitive abilities, a lot more. So here's a couple of things that, that you can do to try and improve your sleep. So it's recommended that you get seven to nine hours of sleep a night, which I know is really, really difficult to do, but here's a few ways that you can you know, try and improve that a little bit. So prioritizing sleep is important. Um, sort of prioritize it like you would sort of social events or doing your exercise or you know, making good meals. Um, light, no screens before bed, try not to have screens in your <coughs> bedroom, and also maybe invest in some blackout blinds. Avoid caffeine if you can, try and avoid it late afternoon if you can't. I know I definitely can't avoid caffeine, so. <laughs> um, and also sound, so having um, nice thick windows and things like that, but contradictory. You can also listen to white, pink, or brown noise to sort of help you get to sleep. The issue with that is that when the noises sort of stop, it can actually jolt you awake a little bit. You might not notice that you wake up, but your brain will sort of switch on, which can be quite bad for you know, your overall sleep. Um, also, the, the sort of recommended ideal temperature is 16 to 18 degrees. And it, you don't have to split beds if you find that your partner is making you feel too warm. You can actually just split blankets, and that should help quite a lot. Also, don't always believe your Fitbits. They are not always accurate and can actually stress you out more and make it a lot harder for you to get to sleep. And this is everyone's favorite, is to avoid alcohol. <laughs> it is actually a sedative, so you won't get proper sleep cycles, you won't get proper sleep states. And as I said, this talk is do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> You can't see that very well, but I'm hugging a wine bottle in bed, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Time for questions. Yeah. Any questions? How have you changed your sleeping habits since you read the book? Um, so I've stopped having my phone in bed. Um, Apart from on weekends, I like to have, well, not, not in bed, but I like, I like to have my phone on my um, bedside table over weekends, but during the week I like to leave it downstairs. Um, it helps me not get distracted by Facebook and things, so I think that's quite useful. Um, also, I have an alarm that I can't snooze. <laughs> so snoozing is actually really bad for you. Um, basically, every time that you, you get jolted awake, it kind of, it makes your heart kind of jump slightly. So every time that you do that, it's actually putting stress on your heart. So um, try and invest in something that doesn't sort of, that you can't snooze, basically. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you not think there's a danger of becoming obsessed with it and therefore it's counterproductive? Almost like overanalyzing your sleep doesn't help. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I think it can be quite dangerous, um, especially with the Fitbit, because it tracks your deep sleep and it tracks your REM sleep. But as I said, they are not accurate because it's based off like heart rate and movement. Um, so like mine always says that I get like zero deep sleep, which it like can't can't be true. But I think if you do start to worry too much, then you really need to go see a, like a sleep doctor or something. But yeah, it can be detrimental because I spent a little bit of time like maybe a couple of weeks going to bed being worried that like I wasn't going yeah, to get yeah. enough sleep. Um, so I yeah, definitely. The clock doesn't help. It's just, it's oh. Because you should be asleep anyway. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that's something that's nice about not having, a, having my phone yeah. in bed. And the clock is like a tiny little sort of thing, so I can't really read it when it's dark. Right, should we leave it there? People have come down from the rooms. Can we have a massive round of applause? Sure.